everyone. Thank you for inviting us. Um, my name is Elena Pascala, and I'm the CEO and founder of Nava Center, and this is Susie Hickey, and she is the rehab director and the best therapist I've ever met. <laughs> but that's not too bright. So I think it's important that I start off by telling my story. So I'm the, a parent of a child that had a near drowning accident on his first birthday. After the first ten, three days in the hospital, the doctors took us into the little room and said we should leave. I was with my husband and I was pregnant with my second child. They said you should leave the hospital and forget you had him and go on with your life. And obviously, by the look of your faces, you all know how that feels. And I'm like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. And after two months in the hospital, I took him home in a semi-comatose state. Not aging myself, but they did not have the internet. <laughs> so I went to the library and I researched brain injuries and what to do. I found a book, it's called What to Do About Your Brain Injured Child by Glenn Doman. And it was based on a home program um, where it's the Institutes for the Achievement of Human Potential. And it's a home program where you learn how to bombard the brain with information and pattern the brain. So we had 60 volunteers. A volunteer came into our house every hour on the hour. And we did a form of pattering where one person held the head and then you had one on each side and you would actually pattern a crawling motion where you get the left and right hemispheres of the brain to connect. And then we did hot packs and cold packs and um, board cards. We actually, there was a program called How to Teach Your Baby to Read, where you start at six months and you hold up flashcards. And we did that with Cody for, we were on the program for two years and we brought him out of a coma. Mm -hmm. um, although his physical development, he was still very, very spastic and stiff and we couldn't get him beyond that. Um, so I did a lot of crazy therapies, like, I don't know if it's crazy as Natalie, but I'm around a close second. <laughs> but I tried everything I could get my hands on. You know, I actually met with an uh, Indian medicine man and did hands-on therapy. I, like all of you, you're searching for hope, and I tried everything I could. Um, from the ages from five to six, Cody Cree, or excuse me, five to 11, he kind of plateaued, he didn't make any gains. But I was okay. It was like, okay, this is like, you know, we didn't sit back and think, you know, for me, we just went on. We had an amazing life of camping and wrestling and all other different things that we met our own therapies. At the age of 11, <coughs> Cody was picked by the Children's Make-A-Wish Foundation to be the 1,000 wish because his wish was to go downhill skiing. Well, he was featured on Extra TV, and after two months later, when we were waiting for a segment, to come on, it was bumped by another segment that says, New Hope for Children with Disabilities in Mielo, Mielno, Poland. Needless to say, I was there in two months. <laughs> I fundraised over $30,000 and my journey began. After Cody's first trip, first experience of intensive therapy, he came back with meaningful weight exchange from the right hip to the left hip. And without that, and without the, developing the balance, he basically could not move beyond that. His therapist was amazed. She had been with him for six years and she was an amazing therapist. But she got to see him a half an hour twice a week, which oh, as you guys know, if you go to the gym a half an hour twice a week, it's not gonna do anything for your body. And that's where our children, that's where, you know, what happens when <clears throat> most of the kids are diagnosed is what the amount of therapy they get. So after this, we had nine families from Iowa going to Poland with me. I made 14 trips. When we began, Cody drove a power chair with his head. And after, excuse me, not 14 trips, I made nine trips. And at the end of the ninth trip, Cody was actually walking with minimal assistance. It changed his life and my life and the family's life, obviously. So um, that's kind of how I sent, uh, so we traveled all around the world doing different therapies. And that's kind of the base of Napa. I sent therapists around the world. We've been to Chile for the CME, Cuevas Medic Exercise. And Medic and Cuevas Medic Exercise was actually designed or developed by two therapists. And one's now in Canada and does Medic. And then, of course, Ramon is in Santiago and does the CME. But they're just called different things. And we've had therapists both in Canada and in um, Santiago to be trained in these therapies, which Lisa is going to go into more detail. Um, at the age of 20, Cody, because he had the ATR reflex of turning his head, he had, was wearing down, he had a stenosis in his neck, and he started losing abilities. 
And so um, he had to have a neck surgery that paralyzed him. Mm -hmm. And three different doctors said that he was just like Christopher Reeves, that he would never eat, speak. And so needless to say, we started doing, we took him home and started doing intense therapy again. And he's gained about 65% of the back, where he drives a power chair, but he can talk well enough for you to understand. If you're 22 and blonde, he can understand you much better. <laughs> <laughs> out of the food for motivators. Because <laughs> the therapy clinic was a mess when she was gone. <laughs> my son now lives on his own in Santa Monica. He drives a power chair. He'll be all over the community. He'll be on buses or I don't really want to know where he is. <laughs> because when he lived with me, he wasn't allowed to go beyond the walk. And he was 19. And he actually, um, I started Napa Center in California, but I was commuting back and forth to Iowa because there's five of us uh, families that we actually had a house built for the five kids that were becoming adults. And it was two blocks from me. I was like, this is a perfect setup. I'll have to continue to commute. Well, Cody actually called the United Cerebral Palsy and the Westside Regional Center and actually moved himself to California without me knowing. <laughs> <laughs> they had an apartment and I was like, oh, you need caregivers, this and like, He's faxed all the medical records. His apartment and caregivers are waiting for him. So, I'm very proud of him. He's oh, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, in not in a million years would I have dreamed of what he accomplished. You know, as all of you, we dream big of our kids, but it, I guess, just like I said, I never let him go beyond the block. So just remember, sometimes we really hold him back. <laughs> and I'd like to turn it over to Lisa. So, and there is Cody. Yeah. You, my boy. My son. Um, so again, what should you get from this? I'm gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about alternative therapies, but I'm gonna we're gonna talk about rephrasing that alternative phrase because when you come out of your doctors with the I'm gonna try an alternative therapy, um, they don't always react the most favorably, right? So we're gonna try to rephrase that a little bit throughout our talk. Um, what parents are saying. So I find that I get the most information from parents. Like Natalie and I talk all the time. She tells me everything she's doing, and then I get to share that with other parents. So. Um, we'll talk about kind of what parents are saying about the different types of therapies. Um, I'll go into a little bit more technical detail about some of the therapies that has talked about, and then um, how to choose what's right for your child, right? Because you can't do everything. There's limited time, limited resources. So um, I'm not going to tell you which one to pick, but I'll give you guys some clues as to kind of how we can pick between all the different kinds of things. Okay, so there's traditional therapies, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, right? You guys have probably all done these before. A lot of the therapies we're going to talk about beyond this are done by OTs, PTs, and speeches. So again, when you're talking to your doctors about alternative therapies, say, oh, my PT is doing this new technique, but they're still using the frame of reference that their kind of clinical skills have given them. So again, rephrasing that alternative word, but saying that it's done by your OT or PT. Um, um, so <coughs> hypotherapy, we don't do this in Napa, but I want to kind of give you guys an unbiased opinion. Like, there's lots of great therapies out there that Napa doesn't do. And one of them is hypotherapy, um, and it's done by a PT or OT. Therapy to horseback riding is different. So when you guys are going and looking for um, therapeutic riding or hypotherapy, you should know that there's a difference. Um, hypotherapy is done by a physical or occupational therapist. Therapy to horseback riding is really adaptive riding. So it's about the recreation of horseback riding, um, not necessarily the therapy of building a stronger trunk or um, improving balance or coordination. So. Um, that's the difference, the benefit. So a lot of times our kids aren't walking, our little friends aren't walking, and um, the gait of the horse is the most similar thing to mimic walking um, in, a, in children. So that they get the benefit of the balance, the pelvic rotation on the horse that they, ne they might not necessarily get otherwise, right, by themselves. Um, I think Cody did it, right? Yeah, <laughs> I did uh, people therapy for about six years, and. When he was 14, I used to drive an hour each way. Yeah. And when he was 14, where the, the stable that we used to go to, they used to play nursery rhymes. And at 14, 
you know, Cody was like, but I still want, I knew it was great therapy, so I didn't care, I wanted to keep going. And he was like on the horse, and he's clear across the arena, and he yells out, and the nursery room stops, and he yells out as clear as can be, are we having fun yet? Needless <laughs> <laughs> to say, that was the last time he did it, but I believe it on Strap, strong heavy. <laughs> I don't understand what this hip hippotherapy is. It's, uh, it's, oh, sorry, I should have probably said that ahead of time. It's therapy oh. on horseback. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, yeah, it's like the scientific name hippotherapy is the scientific name for horses, that's the hippotherapy. Um, I think that parents really like this therapy, one, because they're getting PT and OT on the horse, which what I think that's too, but there's something amazing about the social relationship that you can form between a horse and a child. And so a lot of parents, not only like the therapy, but also the, like how closely in tune a horse is with a child's emotions. Um, they're really sensitive animals, so that whole relationship I think is what a lot of parents like about the, the therapy. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the one I think a lot of people are excited to hear about is CME and Medic. Um, this is a manual type of therapy. So it's like a physical therapy, but OTs and CTs can both be trained in it. Um, there's some word on the street that sometimes psychologists from different countries can be trained on it too. Um, I don't think United States psychologists maybe, they don't get any sort of body training, but I think that's to be seen. Um, requirements, um, you have to be um, three months or older. And then kind of your age depends on how big you are. So like Gianna's kind of big, but she can still do CME because she can take a lot of weight through her legs. That aerial you saw, um, that's pretty <coughs> handler intensive. So if we're doing moves like that, it's basically based on the handler's capability. So how much can I lift? I could lift about 45 pounds. So your child, if they need a lot of handling, I can probably work with them until they're about 45 pounds. Now if they're 45 pounds and taking a lot of weight through their legs and I, say I don't have to help them as much, then I can maybe see them until they're 65, 70 pounds. We have you know, it just depends on how big the kid is and how high their functioning is. You won't really know that. Like a lot of times, we'll get intake paperwork into NAPA, and we'll say, "We'll say I, the first thing I always look for is the weight and the age, because that's that makes a big difference, and then their level of function." And a lot of times, it'll say like, "Oh, can take steps with an assistance." Well, a lot of people don't hold people by their ankles. They'll say like they'll hold them by their trunk um, or their shoulders, and I always want to see a video of them taking their steps with at the least amount of assistance as possible because then I'll be able to tell you whether or not I'm be able to hold them up during the therapy. So it's, it's dependent on a lot of things, but the best thing you can do if you're kind of considering it is send a video to the place or the state, wherever you think you might be heading, um, and that'll give them a better idea of whether or not your child will be a good candidate for it. Um, diagnoses. Um, pretty much any sort of neurological mus musculoskeletal diagnosis is appropriate, barring any sort of degenerative um, so, leukodystrophies are kind of iffy. Um, again, we don't want to put a lot of neurological stress. David talked a lot about how it's a neurological kind of mapping of the brain. You don't want to put a lot of neurological stress on children who um, aren't getting better, right? That can cause their decline to happen quicker. So, we don't really do gene degenerative conditions. We talked about weight, um, contraindications. Any sort of intense stimulation can cause seizures, so, seizures is a contraindication. Brittle bone. Contraindication. Um, things that we have to be careful for, but don't necessarily rule you out. Uh, the rest. Again, be really specific with whoever you're going to see about CME, um, what kind of concerns you might have about your child's participation. So now what is it? It's basically a specific set of exercises. Um, they're really short, usually, and meaning that they're kind of dynamic. We're not doing like, um, walking by the pelvis for 25 minutes. Like, no, 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 no. Like, each exercise maybe lasts, I would say, up to a minute, and you do that exercise five times. So you might do maybe seven to 10 exercises in a 60-minute session. Um, the exercises are meant to be dynamic, so you saw Gianna kind of flying through the air, right, for the vestibular stimulation. Um, and they're all supposed to um, expose the trunk to to be able to work by itself. So that would be why we don't hold by the pelvis, but we're gonna go lower and lower. So you saw Gianna being held by the ankles on the balls, right? We wanna expose as many body segments as we can to the effects of gravity so they can really work on that. I think CME works so well because it's dynamic. It's not, you get to expose a child to normal movement patterns um, without help. I mean, we're never, when I see people walking, people only by the pelvis, like how do you expect them ever to gain any more trunk control don't ever expose that trunk to having to work, right? So I think that's why CME works so well. 
Parents really like it because they get to see their kids do things that they've never done before, right? Um, balancing a child on a hand and standing. Like, my kid can't even sit up, but they're balancing and standing on a hand. Like, that's an amazing thing. Um, so yeah, it, it provides those autom automatic quick responses. Um, I think I have a couple of videos. Uh, Gian and Natalie showed you a couple of camera up. We'll go to the next one. Okay, so this is Lulu. Lulu has a micro deletion. Um, she can sit. Um, she can't crawl. She can't get into sitting by herself. Um, what else can I tell you about Lulu? She can stand um, with help at the ankles these days or a little bit above. Um, when she started Napa, she wasn't sitting. She wasn't rolling. She was kind of wobbly, actually. Um, super cute block, but now she's doing a lot of different things. So you'll see, this is Rebecca. Rebecca has Lulu standing on this, um, it's kind of a flat bar. It's on this kind of slippery material. And what Rebecca is doing is she's doing all the balancing for Lulu. Lulu just has to stand there and work a little bit on her balance and stay standing, right? For a lot of her friends, staying standing against gravity is hard work. So you'll get to see Lulu. This was, um, she did an intensive. We see her for both traditional and intensive therapy. Um, I'd like to point out that even our kids that we see traditional, for traditional therapies that do intensive therapy um, make tremendous gains in their intensive therapy. And so this was at the end. Lulu was balancing for up to a minute by herself on this um, board by the end. Uh -oh. That might not have made the transfer. Uh oh. Do you have your... Oh, yeah, there it is. You see it? Yeah. <coughs> Then you guys know. So Rebecca will slide that board um, back and forth, um, and Lulu balances up for a minute with no nobody's holding her body. She's only it won't, it won't play. Yeah, she's only standing on the board. So Rebecca moves the board back and forth. Nobody's touching Lulu's body. Rebecca's doing all her balancing, and she's standing by herself. Um, so again, we're exposing all those body segments to gravity, which has she's never had that experience before. Right? Therapist isn't holding her, or she no, is? No, she's not holding her. She's only moving this board. So she's moving the board back and forth. So, um, so for example, if Lulu started to fall forward, then the therapist would move the, bo the board forward so that she could write herself. So she's getting all that kind of information to her neurological system that she's never had before. Um, it's a beautiful thing. Um, that's just another exercise. So we'll go to the neurosuit. You guys can ask questions at the end. I'm sure you guys have lots of questions. Mm -hmm. So what is the neurosuit? Um, it's this not super attractive looking outfit these kiddos have on. It's considered, it's comprised of a vest, shorts, knee pads, um, and shoes. It also has elbow pads and a hat. Um, and they're all connected together with bungees. Um, so kind of like rubber band. Um, this does three main things. One is that we can correct for some musculoskeletal misalignment. So for example, um, if a child toes in, or abducts their hips a lot, we can use the bungees to cue the muscles to work in the right way. Now, we never crank a muscle into position or a body segment into position. That's not the benefit of it. It's more to cue the muscles to work in a specific way. The next thing it does is it provides a load on the body. So up to 40 pounds of pressure can be put on a body at a time. By no means do we put that much money or that much um, pressure on our little friends. Um, but it is a significant load. Um, they, so that load kind of stimulates the anti-gravity response, right? So um, whenever you push a load on the body, you would hope that the body would respond by pushing against it. So I always tell parents, if nothing else in their intensive, the one thing I can guarantee, the only thing I guarantee actually, is that their child's gonna get stronger because they're working against that load for the entire two weeks, uh, or the entire three weeks, intensive for three weeks. Um, and the third thing it does is it provides a lot of proprioceptive input. So for a lot of our CDG friends, right, they don't have the best body awareness. They don't have the best input for them joints and muscles. And what this does by kind of squishing the body together, approximating all the joints and muscles, is it provides increased proprioceptive feedback. You guys have probably heard that buzzword, proprioceptive feedback. That's basically just body awareness. So it helps them get a better sense of their body and space. Um, it's worn for two hours. Um, and that's because it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to put on and five minutes to take it off. So that's 20 minutes. If we did it only in a 60 minute session, you wouldn't get the benefits of kind of being in the suit. 
Um, who can wear it? Anybody over the age of two. Contraindications, again, or anything that would preclude their intense exercise. So pulmonary hypertension, brittle bone disease, um, anything degenerative. Um, and then again, there's um, precautions. Seizures would be one of them. That's why when that was a little iffy if Gianna could start at the beginning. Um, but we figure if she's going to have the seizures, she might as well have them in the suit and be working with them. Um, the one thing I want to say about the suit is that the suit is a tool. It's not a magic bullet, right? Like, a lot of parents want to buy the suit, um, and then and then they, the point is you have to, when you buy the suit, you would have to do the two hours of therapy, because the magic is the therapy that happens. It amplifies kind of all the therapy we're doing, but it's not the therapy, it's not the magic bullet. Now, Natalie bought the suit, but she actually did <coughs> two hours a day for a long time. She committed to doing that. So. By all means, if you're really committed to doing it, then it might be a good tool. But I think there's other things that might work just as good that the kids can wear for longer than their talks would be one. Spio suit. I really like the dynamic motion orth orthotics right now, um, those DMO suits. So if you're looking for, some, for something for support during the day, I think there's better options. This is a great tool for therapists to use um, to amplify and kind of ramp up the benefits of therapy. And one of the things about that, I. The reason we're not a big advocate of buying the suit, one thing you really need to make sure you're putting the suit on correctly so you don't injure your child. Um, and also, I know a little, many, many parents who bought the suit, including myself, and used it twice and never used it again. Because it is, it's hard to do two hours of therapy with you and fit it into your schedule. I've known her for a long time, and I'll tell a really quick story though when Natalie came in. Okay, this is me, it's day one. Here comes Natalie. She's like, she's ready. I look down, and Gianna's having a seizure after seizure. And she's like, we're ready to go. And you're like, they're, it's all right, they're not five minutes, they're less than five minutes. And we were just all like, <laughs> That's but she was better, better though. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't wearing the stopwatch. <laughs> she was. And yeah, we listened, and that's why yeah, she's... Yeah, they did this, they did. Look now how she was there. But yeah. they would have turned me away. I mean, that's the thing, right? I think you guys are going to be, like, we can have guidelines that inform our practice, but we're, we're always going to use our clinical reasoning and best judgment because nobody fits into a box. I think that's what makes that NAPA kind of cool, right? Um, is the individualized part of it. And I'll we'll go a little bit beyond that. Okay, so this universal exercise, you've got to see Gian in this, right? Because you're bouncing around. Um, it's fondly called the cage at the Napa Center, not the best name. Um, I tried to have one of our little friends rename it, and she named it the Rainbow Unicorn Sparkle Room. Um, I don't know, but it probably wouldn't be there. So we don't really have a name of it yet. Um, this universal exercise unit has two main functions. One is this spider cage um, that you see pictures of, and it's called the spider cage because the kids are connected via these bungees. So we'll talk about the bottom one first, the spider cage, I'll go back so you guys can see it. So basically what the spider cage is, is a body weight support system. We can use the bungees to de-weight the body to make um, working against gravity not as difficult. And so for the first time, these kids get to experience kind of upright, independent posture and movement because they're supported by all the bungees. So we get to let go of them and some of the kids are like, I think it's the best thing in the world because they get to be moving free. Now we use it as a therapeutic tool, right? Sometimes if we want to work on um, gait training, um, the treadmill, we can't hold the body up and move the legs at the same time. So we use the bungees to hold us up, um, and then we get to help them with their feet. For bigger kids, it helps with developmental positioning. So if a kid is too big where I can't control their trunk and their legs at the same time, and I really want to work on that half meal to stand, I'm going to use the cage as my extra set of hands. Now beyond that, the benefits, again, like I said, it's the first time that a lot of these kids get to be free, upright against gravity. Um, and for Gianna, she loves it, right? Like she likes to balance and jump. And can you imagine how freeing that must be to have your own independent moving, movement without somebody helping you? Um, we talked a little bit about vestibular input. It's a dynamic system, right? So the kids are getting movement input the entire time they're in there. So um, the vestibular input is really important. Um, and as the kid gets more and more control, we can make the bungees lower and lower. So we're giving them, exposing them to more gravity. And we can also um, take some of the bungees away. So for example, like, um, both these kiddos have the trunk strap, but Gianna didn't have the, the trunk strap in hers, right? She didn't need that. She could keep her trunk upright against gravity and keep bouncing. These little friends, they can't do that yet, right? So they have the, um, the trunk component. Okay, so the next part of the um, 
uh, universal exercise unit cage is the monkey cage. I don't really have a picture of it. It's not the most exciting for kids, but it's really beneficial. And basically what it is is a weight and pulley system where we can do isolated strengthening. So for example, um, a kid might be laying on a massage table. We'll put their leg in an immobilizer um, so we can isolate um, glute activation and they'll work against the pulley for glute activation. It's much like, very similar to the free weight pulley systems that you guys use at the gym. But just more in a therapeutic environment and we can control the, the um, extraneous movements a little better with some of the tools we have. Can you go back to the picture again? Mm -hmm. So I built a cage for my home. And what I did is I got, I was living in Iowa, <coughs> cattle fencing, which is just the side grids here. And we built by two by fours, a frame around it, and made our own cage. Other people have done it where they have a room that they can actually just pick hooks all the way up and down the walls, depending on if you have a small enough room. So you can always get creative, but I felt like Natty, Natalie did as well. It was a great tool for me to use that I could help Cody do some squats and do some <coughs> exercises where I wasn't trying to hold him up with one hand. And, you know, it really kind of, and he would do the same. He would jump because he just loved being free and jumping. It's amazing. All of a sudden, it's like, you, and you can use as many bungees as you need, you know, or like Lisa would say in the upper strap, but you can get creative, you know, get on the internet and look at the pictures and... Yeah. I mean, Cody now together. still comes to Napa when, he's, when it like fits into his cool schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a, a little bit too cool for Napa sometimes. Um, he has more important things to do, like crash red carpet parties, stuff like that. Yes. Um, but he likes to dance in there, so he'll ask us to put music on and then he dances in there. Because he doesn't ever get to dance like standing up, right? So he likes to dance in there these days. Um, true and true Cody. Um, so I want to talk about behavioral interventions because um, I know Natalie has done this and I think um, they actually work really well for a lot of our kids. Um, behavioral interventions are basically just learning models um, and some kids learn better by repetition and that's where an ABA might come in, right, because it's all about repetition. Um, and there's also another one, lesser known, is called VIR floor time. It's not necessarily, they hate being lumped in with behavioral interventions, but they're funded as a behavioral intervention, so that's why they're here. So, ABA, what is it? It's basically a learning model by repetition. It's aimed at um, increasing positive behaviors and extinguishing unwanted behaviors. And they do that many different ways. One is positive reinforcement, so you guys are really familiar with this. Your child does something good, you give them praise. They do something that they, you don't want to see, and there's no response, right? So. Um, and they are really big about um, consistency and repetitive trials, right? So um, put the ball in, put the ball in. If you have to do it with <coughs> hand and the child releases, you give them a big clap, put the ball in. If they throw the ball off the floor, on the floor, then you ignore it. You give them a new ball and you keep saying like, put the ball in. So this works really well with like feeding. Scoop the spoon, bring it to your mouth. You don't do that, you throw the spoon on the floor, we're, we're gonna ignore it, we're gonna give you a new spoon and we're gonna keep going repetitive. Um, a lot of our friends learn this way. I think ABA gets a really bad stigma. One, because it's not super regulated. Um, it's done a lot of times by kids coming out of college right away because they're really enthusiastic and looking for good jobs. So it's, if it's done really well, I think it's a great learning tool. Um, a lot of our friends have had good experience with it, right? Yana does really well with it. She learned how to sip water. Yeah. And we don't do offer this at Napa either. We're just sharing all the information, although our therapists <coughs> use it in their techniques yeah, and they're I mean, all maybe in the background so loving. Yeah. I mean. Um, the next one is called the DIR floor time model. This is more of a relationship based approach. So um, it's called, it's the, I'm trying to think of what DIR stands for. Individual relationship based, I can't remember, directed individual based or directed individualized relationship based model. This floor time intervention is based on that. Um, and basically what they do is the child-led therapy. Rather than the therapist doing the work or doing the actions for the child, they'll see what the child is doing. They'll get down on the floor with them, thus being the four-time model. And they'll imitate the behavior, and then they'll try to start working their way into the behaviors. That, and then they're going to shape the behavior that way. So I, like, I give this example of the difference between the two. So for example, um, if a child was sitting on the, car, on the floor just rolling a car back and Maybe right by their eyeball, right? That's not necessarily a productive behavior that we want to see. We'd want them to see, like, an a ABA therapist might be like, oh, we put the car down the ramp. And so they do hand over hand, right? And we put the car down the ramp 10 times, and we'd see how many times we were able to do that without the child throwing the car, um, eloping from the activity, moving away from the activity. 
Um, and we're really trying to, and every time he did put the card down the ramp, then we'd get that thing, oh, you did a great job. Or sometimes it's like a food reward. So like, here's a little goldfish, or like you saw with Gianna, maybe it might be a bite of food if she did the right thing, right? She's gonna get a positive reward for every time she does it. Now, a floor time therapist um, would lay down on the floor next to the child, and they would imitate the behavior. And it, you'd be amazed when you start to imitate a child's unwanted behavior what their response is. Sometimes they'll move away. Sometimes they'll start looking at you like, wait, what are you doing? This is my thing. What are you doing? And then the therapist might do a little playful obstruction. So I'm going to zoom the car by my head, and then I'm going to bunk it into your car and see what your reaction is, right? And, and slowly, through that relationship of trust that the therapist built with the child, um, they're able to enter the child's world and hopefully bring them into ours with, and shape their behavior that way. Um, these two models are kind of in direct contrast to each other. They don't really like each other. Um, that doesn't mean one is better than the other. I think for some kids, one works better, and one for, that, for other kids, the other thing works better. So again, educate yourself. Kind of, you guys are the experts on your child. Kind of figure out what you think is the best for your child and try it out. If it's not working, then maybe try something else. Um, new techniques for speech therapy. Um, the Hannon program, it's a parental education program. It just arms um, speech therapists with a lot of tools to help um, parents help their kids learn how to um, develop language. Um, there's a big home exercise or a home program component to it. Um, so it, I think it's a good tool for a speech therapist to have in their belt. The next one that I think um, is really important is this talk <coughs> technique for speech therapy, and I'm really excited about this. In speech therapy, the pendulum swings back and forth a lot. A lot of times it's like language-based, so they'll say like, oh, you don't need to work on oral motor, the language will, the oral motor will develop when the language comes along. Well, do we really think that's true? Like, maybe if that kid sees walking enough and we try to walk them enough, they'll just start walking. No, like, I don't really like that theory, right? Um, and then there's the oral motor thing, um, oral motor-based kind of pen, other side of the pendulum where they're like, if you work on the oral motor, that's what's impacting speech, and then the language will come. Well, prompt is a combination of those both. I, that's why I really like it. It's basically a set of oral motor cues given in the context of speech. So, for example, if your child was swinging on the swing and you're really working on that mm more sound, right? Um, as soon as the child attempted a word approximation, then you would give the tactile cue on the top lip so that they could do the oral motor, bring the top lip down for the more. So it's those, those kind of tactile oral motor cues within the context of language. So I think it's kind of a good intermediary ground. It's a great technique. More and more therapists are being trained in it. Um, and ask, ask your speech therapist if they are or aren't, um, because they probably would want to go get trained. A lot of speech therapists are really interested in that. Um, and I think a lot of therapies that do it do advertise that they do it on their on their website, so you can check it out. And then I want to talk about AAC, right? So that's augmented alternative communication. Um, I find that a lot of parents are resistant to this AAC. Um, and I think it's because they think the therapist gave up on my child talking, right? Your child, they think my child's not gonna talk, so they're gonna throw some technology at them and that's the way they're gonna learn how to talk. Um, I wanna say that that's not true. Research shows that it just opens a window to communication. Um, we've all probably met friends, our little friends, that they know what's going on, but they can't talk and then they get really frustrated, right? So, and then by you not giving them a strategy to express themselves because they're maybe not ready to talk, it might happen later. Um, it's, it's not really fair. So AAC can be low tech or high tech. It can be an iPad, it can be a Dynavox, it can be a pod book. Um, and basically what it does is teach a language model, right? It introduces language to your child, even though they might not have spoken language yet, you're still giving them a language to communicate with. And I think it's really important. Um, it's kind of the same thing as sign language. Like uh, if your child can't say more, but they can sign more and they're communicating to you, then they realize that language has a purpose. Right? And so if they, can't, if they don't realize language that doesn't have a purpose because they don't have a spoken one and nobody's responding to their cues, um, then they're not going to develop that center in their brain. You know, it's going to come along a little slower. So I would say I'm a proponent of this earlier rather than later. Um, again, it doesn't block verbal communication if a child's going to develop. It just helps them kind of along their way to verbal communication. And if they don't get verbal communication, then they have a great communication strategy. And you want to do this before your kids get in school, right? You want to start it early because once they get in school, you know, if you, our kids get written off all the time, right? And especially if they don't have language because they, people think they don't know what's going on and they're not able to communicate. So empower your children to try to find a strategy to communicate with them and, and really find a specialist that knows about AAC. Um, 
because a lot of speech therapists say they can do it, um, but there's a lot that goes into it, and I really do think it's a specialty, so really finding somebody that knows about AAC is really imperative for kids that are going to go along this route. Okay, vital stim for swallowing and feeding therapy. So, again, vital stim is a tool that we use in feeding and swallowing therapy. It is not the therapy. Um, what is it? It's a form of electrical stimulation. It's The electrodes are placed on the throat um, or the face sometimes, um, and it provides a muscular contraction. Now, what that does is it's supposed to strengthen and coordinate the swallow. Um, so, typically, kids who get vital stim are kids that, who have dysphagia an uncoordinated swallow, a weak swallow, an absent swallow, they're not swallowing at all. Sometimes we can kind of get it going with this vital stim therapy. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about vital stim. It started as a, in the adult population uh, for stroke rehab. Um, it's moved to the pediatric population probably within the last 10 years. Chalk is the number one <coughs> pediatric researcher of vital stim therapy. Um, they put it on babies in the NICU. Um, so, a lot of parents are afraid to put electrical stimulation on the kids, but when I tell them that the NICU babies get it, then they think, like, well, the NICU babies are getting it. It's probably not going to hurt my kiddo. Again, a lot of the research of body, because it's a new therapy, um, the research body for it is little. It's still expanding. Um, and so a lot of doctors will say, you know, the, the research isn't there to back it up. Well, it's brand new. Of course, the research, that gigantic body that they want, research of body, that the <coughs> body of research that they want to support something isn't going to be there, but that doesn't mean it doesn't we see really good things with this. And I think CHOC is a very, Children's Hospital of Orange County is a very reputable organization and they're <laughs> using it within their practice. Um, and insurance covers it. And insurance covers it. Medi-Cal will actually cover it as well. So that, there's something to be said there. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Again, like I said, a lot of speech therapists say it changes the anatomy of the swallowing and the sequence of it. It's not true. There's a lot of misconceptions about there. Do your own research, but we found it to be a very effective tool with our population. Um, auditory programs, I want to talk about these because not very many people know about them. A lot of people do OT and they'll do a lot of sensory therapy, you know, like sensory aversions, like their kids don't want to touch anything. Sometimes their kids cover their ears when it's loud. Um, but we don't often address the auditory system um, as a sensory system, and these programs do that. Um, basically what it is, there it's music and it's modified um, to highlight certain frequencies and take other frequency, frequencies away to target specific areas of the brain. Now the programs, there are a few different programs out there. They do it in different ways, and the sequence of how they, which areas of the brain they target first is different. But the general gist is, um, by highlighting certain frequencies of music, you can trigger and awaken certain areas of the brain. Um, you can also, so that's how it works on a neurological level. You can also train the ear muscles to respond, respond to differences in volumes better. So for a sensory <coughs> sensitive kind of people that are sensitive to um, auditory input, it's a great strategy and tool. Um, the listening program I listen are two um, programs that are really popular. Those are home programs. They are about $1,000. Now it sounds like a lot, but you get to keep the equipment, right? You do it under the guidance of a, a licensed practitioner. Usually it's OT or PT, or OT or speech, but some PTs also do it. Um, and it's done at home. So basically you do it at home and then it's monitored by a therapist. Um, you get to keep the equipment, so even if you did it one time with a therapist and then you decided to do it on your own, like it's your equipment, you can do it. A lot of parents can do it with multiple children in the house, like it has also been effective for attention deficit disorder, um, Down syndrome, um, it really helps with emotional regulation, um, pro language processing, um, cognition, memory attention, um, lots of different things. They use it on PTSD, um, post-traumatic brain injuries, and then kind of the pediatric populations. Um, hyperbaric oxygen chamber, this is just another soft chamber. Um, you saw the one Natalie had, it's kind of more of like a tube shape, this is a tent shape. Um, so Natalie talked about how Gianna was breathing 100% oxygen when she was in the heart chamber. Um, that's the benefit of, there's two main benefits of the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. One is you breathe oxygen at a higher concentration, right? Even in a soft chamber, you're breathing at about 25%. Anything about that's flammable. So you can bring your electronics in soft chambers. You cannot bring your electronics in hard chambers um, because it's flammable because of the increased oxygen. Um, so one, you're breathing increased oxygen. The next thing is, is typically um, oxygen is transported in the body by red blood cells. But when you breathe oxygen under pressure, 
in a hard chamber or a soft chamber, um, that oxygen diffuses into other fluids in your body. So your lymphatic fluids, your cerebral spinal fluid, um, it can also diffuse <coughs> into tissues like muscles. Um, and what that does is when oxygen is more available in a system, it can go to more areas in the body. So the theory is, is that it can go to areas that may be dormant or injured. Um, so those are the two main benefits of, or that's, that's the two main ways that hyperbaric works. That's kind of a brief, it's really detailed and really complex. That's kind of the dumbed down version I can give you guys. Um, I don't really know anything more beyond that. So again, do your own research. Cody did the hyperbaric. Yeah, we did. guys <coughs> and. After the first 40, we, we and I actually went down to Dr. Neubauer, who is in Florida. He's the pioneer. And after the first 40, I noticed that he had his business and his eyes were more focused, and his speech were a little, was definitely a little better. And it was a little bit, but as you guys know, we live on those little bits. And so I did another one. The second one I didn't do, see as much, but I use the chamber every week <laughs> myself. So. I actually broke a leg and the doctors could not believe how my bone grew back so quickly. I was five weeks ahead of healing. And they said, what are you doing? And I said, I could just talk to you. Um, these are some other methods on the stuff here for you. I think Natalie's going to put a couple on her website. Um, just, again, resources, buzz we've heard about at the clinic um, of other therapies. So you might want to check them out. Um, again, I only put them up there because I've heard parents have really good things to say about them. They're good. So you can do some more research. And then I just wanted to finish up talking about this intensive model of therapy, right? So what is intensive model? It varies a little bit by clinic by clinic, but at Napa, the kids come for three weeks, five days a week, between two to six hours, depending upon parent goals, um, therapeutic tolerance, um, and what we kind of see we can make a big bang for their buck when the kids come. Um, usually I design the program, so a parent will say, I want my kid to walk by the end, I want them to talk, and I would like them eating better. So I'm like, oh, okay. So we usually do two hours of soup therapy, an hour of CME, and then we would maybe do feeding, if they want their, or a speech therapy, or because we have speech therapists and feeding, sometimes we combine them in one session. Now, the great thing about um, SNAPA is I think that OTs and PTs and speech do so many different things that there's lots of funding options. So like, for example, a lot of times your insurance will pay for a PT and OT and a speech session in one day, so we have enough specialists where we can at least bill your insurance for those three hours and then you're not having to private pay as much of that cost. Um, how often? We have some crazy parents that do them four times a year. Um, if you can get in there twice a year, I think parents really find that. Um, beneficial for their kiddos. Again, we have traditional patients that do intensive and we still see tremendous gains within the intensive model just because the kids are doing so much repetition in such a short period of time. Um, and how much is too much? We say that we like the three month break in between each session, right? Take, the kids go home and they're still integrating everything they've kind of learned from the session for like the next six to eight weeks. So it wouldn't be beneficial if you did a session right afterwards. Um, and it's just too much stress on the body. The kids need time to recover as we can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the expectations. Again, parents, that's the magic question. They always ask me, like, when I come to NASA, what can I expect? Again, I always say, right, um, we don't sell fluid. Like, I'm not going to promise you any milestones. I can't do that. Every kid is different. Every kid progresses at a different rate. Um, but I can tell you that your kid's going to get stronger. You're going to go home with an excellent home exercise program. So at NAPA, we film now. You go home with about seven to ten exercises on film that you can work on at home. Um, that, though we don't guarantee milestones, they often happen at Napa. I don't think I've ever had a parent come to Napa and say, like, I'm so sad I did this. This was like a complete waste of my time. Like, I don't think that's a feedback. I've never gotten that feedback before. It might have happened, but it's not the feedback I think a lot of parents have. I think if you can do an intensive program, you would be really happy with your results. 